Donald Trump won election in 2016, vowing to build a wall, to deport all unauthorized residents, and to massively reduce the number of people welcomed here legally. COVID-19, which has its origins in Wuhan, China, may help the president to deliver fully on those campaign promises. Is the mythology of America as a nation of immigrants coming to an end? I can't point to an incident in American history, at least, where financial and economic collapse led to, you know, a kumbaya feeling <laughs> where everyone is like, oh, you're different from me. That's OK. A deputy national editor at The New York Times, Jia Lin Yang is the author of the timely new book, One Mighty and Irresistible Tide, The Epic Struggle Over American Immigration, 1924 to 1965. The book begins at another dark moment in American immigration policy when a restrictive law ended a long period of relatively open borders and effectively stopped mass movement to the United States. It tells the story of the decades-long battle that led the U.S. to begin accepting foreigners once again. And yet, nobody involved in that fight foresaw the extent to which the 1965 law signed by President Lyndon Johnson would open the door once again to new immigrants including Yang's family, which came here from Taiwan in the 1970s. Our beautiful America was built by a nation of strangers from a hundred different places or more. They have poured forth into an empty land, joining and blending in one mighty and irresistible tide. I sat down with Yang in our studio in early March and then more recently in May to discuss what her book and personal story can teach us about the current moment. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Jia Lin. Thank you Thanks for, for speaking me. with Reza. Uh, you have a personal connection to immigration, particularly the laws of the period that your book covers. What is it? So my family would not be here if not for the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act. And when I began working on this whole project, I'd never heard of the law, never been taught it in high school or college. I had just been told, like I think a lot of American families, the, the gauzy story of how we ended up here at all. And basically my family's from China. And after the Civil War and the Communist one in 1949, my grandparents all left for Taiwan, like a lot of other refugees. And then my parents grew up there and then came to the U.S. in the 60s and 70s for college and grad school. And that's how we came here. And then we have cousins, aunts, everyone's here. That was always the very pat glowing story of and and we're a nation of immigrants so everybody yeah. ends up here so of right? course we were allowed to yeah. come here right and growing up my friends also you know their parents were from Iran Afghanistan Poland all over the world i just took for granted that if your family wanted to come here it sounds naive now to say that given especially right now how much we're debating who can come in and who can't but for my own family i just thought we're immigrants this country's always wanted immigrants we're chinese there are all these chinese americans around obviously we're here so let's talk about um, Im American immigration policy. And, you know, just to bra let's say from the beginning of the Republic up through 1880, 1882, what was the what was the immigration policy and then what changed right around that? Our immigration policy was quite open. We needed people to come and colonize this land. And so we were very open. If you basically wanted to show up, we didn't have visas. There were no passports. There wasn't border control. If you got here, and this was true until really the 1920s, if you got here and you made it physically, this long, long journey, you could be here. Um, naturalization, we did have in 1790, the founders lay down the only people eligible for naturalization were free whites. And so that was one restriction. But really, we didn't have people from Asia and the Middle East the way we do now. So this seemed, it was all European, right? Although in the 1880s, the Chinese Exclusion Act came about. And, you know, this is, I mean, it's its disturbing to think about it now, but they certainly were not hiding the ball. What was, what was the function of that? And how did that change immigration? So in 1882, the U.S. has for the first time an immigration law restricting people coming in based on their ethnicity. We had not done that before. And this was fueled by a huge anti-Asian backlash against Chinese laborers in particular. So it was a particular class of immigrants coming. It wasn't diplomats or teachers or educated people, it was workers. And so in 1882, we banned all Chinese laborers. And from that point on, you can see that we're, as a country, slowly but surely adding more and more restrictions. Um, in 1917, a big federal law is passed. But 
But again, it's still a fairly porous situation. You know, we want literacy to some degree, but if you're literate in a language that's not English, that's fine too. You know, very, very few people are turned away from the border. And at this point, you're talking about people flooding into Ellis Island. Again, tons of still more European immigrants, Southern and Eastern Europe. And that's who's coming, and we're mainly allowing them. But you are seeing from the Chinese Exclusion Act, we're beginning by race to decide if we want you or not. And then there was a later kind of addendum, which I guess was not an official immigration policy, but that excluded Japanese. Yes. So when the Chinese laborers are banned, these uh, rail companies, these farms, they still need people to work work these jobs. And so other cheap Asian labor essentially arrives, including a lot of Japanese immigrants. This sets off a whole new wave of kind of anti-Asian backlash, in particular on the West Coast. And so the U.S. and Japan have an agreement that basically, it's not so formal, it's not passed for the Senate, but it says, it's called the Gentleman's Agreement. It says, why don't you just do your best to keep people from coming from Hawaii, a lot of Japanese immigrants are going there, from coming to the mainland. And that takes hold, too. So you just see there are efforts to basically, as they see Asian immigrants come, begin to sort of stem that tide. But meanwhile, you know, Eastern and Southern European immigrants, people from Italy, Russia, they're pouring into the country. And that's what triggers so then this in, massive in, restriction. Yeah, in 1924, that's when, I, I mean, there had been, as you were mentioning, there were a couple of other laws leading up to that. But in 1924, what, what changes in immigration policy? They look at the entire system and they reshape it in ways that change the country forever. They basically say, you know, based on eugenics and other experts who tell them, you know, we're studying all these different ethnicities. In fact, they didn't even have this idea of ethnic is not really how they're working in this time. When they think of race, they think of kind of what we consider an ethnicity or nationality. So Southern Italians were one race. One race. Northern Italians, another race. Hebrew is a race. These are all different races of people. And, oh, look, we're scientists and we're going to study each of these races. And to tell you, well, this race you know, is it's not all bad things. It's It could be yeah. something positive about well, you. Your... Know, Italians were very good with their hands. I say this because I'm part Italian, so I can, but they were good with their hands and they were dumb but hard laborers if they weren't anarchists and bomb throwers. So. Right, but then also yeah. prone to criminality uh, and yeah. these sort of, yeah. you know, they so, would... Well, that's, well, that one's true, but... Yeah. They, they would claim to go into prisons right. and, you know, mental health institutions and basically say, like, we see a lot of people from Poland here yeah. That tells us that if you're and of this the Polish is race, also great. But I mean, where Jews uh, early on, you know, would score, you know, in the idiot range on IQ tests, and then somehow, so we didn't let them in. But then, you know, ten years later, they're they're flooding Ivy League institutions, right. so we need quotas against. Yes, them. yes. So it's very inexact. Yes, but everyone is yeah. making. I mean, it's a fake science, of course. Right. But they're going through and and coming up with these really big, hefty reports saying we have cataloged all of the entire human, humankind by these races. And we've decided there are some people that just shouldn't be coming into this country because to allow them in would be to change the gene pool of this country and it would change our bloodlines. It would threaten our ability to be a democracy, right? What if we're inviting people in who just don't get democracy because their race wow. you know, is I've not never prone heard, to it? I've never heard that argument ever uttered in, you know, in recent memory. So in 1924, uh, or as a result of the 24 law, though, and and this is also jerry-rigged where uh, the number of people who are legally allowed into the country from certain European countries, it's pegged to the 1890 census yes. as a way of keeping out, you know, the, the Jews and the Italians and the Poles, the Southern and Central Europeans in particular. But you write at one point that um, in 1925, total arrivals plummeted 58% from the year before from uh, more than uh, 700,000 to fewer than 300,000. So this is like a real gate coming down. Yes, this is transformative. You have steamships coming right before this coming into Ellis Island. And again, these are levels of immigration that are totally historic. Mm -hmm. Like New York is just transformed overnight. Right. Right. You go from, let's say, 14,000 or so Russian Jews to nearly half a million in the span of just a few decades. So the city is is transformed forever. But once these gates come down, all of that really stops. Right. And then a couple of years later, the Depression hits, which tamps things down. Then there's World War II. Yeah. Your book is talking about that period from, you know, the 1924 Act until the 1965 Act, which is mm-hmm. the first major overhaul of, of uh, immigration in, in decades, but with some tinkering that we'll get to. So then what, what starts happening after 19, you know, in 1925 to say like about 1950? What, 
what's going on with immigration policy? Because we do have a world war and we have a lot of refugees. We have a lot of displaced people. Suddenly, China, which had been kind of this antagonist because it was sending over these coolies who were, you know, could work like machines. And so we didn't want that. But then, you know, after World War II, it turns, you know, communist China is suddenly, you know, that's a bad thing. And we want to be friendly with Taiwan and other China. Like, mm -hmm. how, how does all, how do geopolitics change or complicate immigration policy, say, from 1925 to about 1950-55? If you imagine the 1920s as being a very isolationist, very, you know, pro-America nationalist time where people are sort of, we're literally closing off borders. It's very inward looking. World War II changes all of that, right? Well beyond immigration. The idea of the United States being on the world stage, having these very deep moral obligations to other countries around the world. And so as we're fighting this war, it becomes clear that our immigration laws don't match in many ways our foreign policy. So one very tangible example is, you know, in 1882, that Chinese Exclusion Act banned also the naturalization of anyone who's Chinese. Right. So again, something I took for granted. My parents naturalized and became American citizens that wasn't allowed in, you know, starting 1882. But during the war, the Chinese are our allies. And it seems embarrassing and downright insulting to signal to our ally, we don't actually think that you're, you're up to, you know, up to snuff to be citizens. And so we allow Chinese immigrants to naturalize. We slowly crack the door open to Chinese immigration. We allow about 100 people of Chinese descent to come in. That's, Not I, I very mean, generous, amazing. but it's, yeah. it's symbolic, right. right? It's saying, oh, this is actually pretty, mm -hmm. pretty retrograde. We can't do this. It's, it's in conflict with our foreign policy. And then in addition to that, you see, of course, during the Holocaust, there is this massive refugee crisis. And you have people, Jews in Eastern Europe, all trying to come to the U.S. And this is where we begin to see, well, you can't really admit any of these people because you've just passed these quotas saying we don't want anyone from this part of the world. And so there begin to be lawmakers, someone, Manny Seller, a Brooklyn congressman from New York, not well known, but I'd argue just one of the one of the like most powerful he, uh, Democrats and liberal will, lawmakers yeah, ever. We will get to him in a second because he's the hero of your book and virtually all books about immigration yes. in, uh, in the 20th century. Yeah. Um, yeah, what what happened to the racial dogmas? Because this is also, um, you know, and, and somebody like Daniel Okren in last mm -hmm. year's uh, The Guarded Gate talks about how the Nazis actually looked at the race science that was being used to fix American for, uh, immigration policy in the early 20th century was adopted by the Nazis. We fight the Nazis. We beat the Nazis. We realize, eh, you know, maybe their race science wasn't such a good idea after all. How does that change the way that we talk about immigration, because there's still a lot of racism uh, and xenophobia going on. So this whole idea in the 20s where eugenics was this all-powerful science, once we begin to fight Nazi Germany, it becomes clear that they are basing all of their horrors on this terrible race science. We, of course, begin to very much back away from it. So on the Hill, when immigration is discussed, people are really saying like, well, I don't I don't really believe in eugenics, obviously. Yeah. And Truman, who's president at this time, and I'd argue a kind of a little known figure in the history of immigration, you don't think of him as a big figure in it, but he's an incredibly important linchpin in this whole thing because he's inherited this unfinished war from FDR, right? And he is looking at the refugee crisis at all of this bunk science that's powered these really racist quotas in our immigration. He says, none of this makes any sense. And we have to, if we're going to fight this war and we're going to win it on moral terms, our immigration policy isn't, is immoral as well, right? It reflects this race science and it has to be changed. Yeah. So he is the first one really um, in the White House in American history to begin saying we need a formal refugee policy because our immigration policy is so is so hostile right now to, to changing these quotas, to letting these people in. We need a separate kind of way of saying, hey, if you have, you know, a political reason that you need safe harbor, we're going to allow you to come. So even this idea that we take for granted now, if you're going to have a sponsor, right, like a lot of Christian groups or nonprofits will sponsor a refugee, this begins under Truman. And in 1948, he signs essentially the first Refugee Act in federal history. And this is, I mean, he's also thoughtful because geopolitically, a lot of the people that we need as, as allies in the Cold War are people who come from countries that we were like, no, we don't like your kind, whether it's Japan, uh, Korea, or parts of Europe. Um, 
in uh, the early 50s, there's something called the McCarran-Walter Act, which is one of the first, really the most significant change in immigration policy since the 20s. What was in that? How did, FD, uh, how did Truman respond? And then what happened next? So the 1952 law is this huge, basically, it's a way of redoing potentially the 1920s law, right? So if that was this big, you know, country altering law, 1950s is a chance for everyone, all sides of this to come together and say, how do we feel about those laws and how they've worked and how much do we want to change them? And so there is a huge, huge fight, basically, where, where a lot of these people coming out of the Holocaust, World War II, saying, OK, enough is enough. These laws are clearly racist and bad. We've got to change them. But you have during this time as well, it's the Cold War and McCarthyism is at full, full force. And often in our history, when people are anti-immigrant, it's also mixed up in anti-radical, anti-communist ideas. And so the sense of, well, we don't really want to change our immigration laws too much because we don't want these people coming in who are radicals, who are spies, who are going to undermine I'm, us. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm laughing because it is like when you start to think about it. So it's when the Soviet Union starts pushing into Eastern Europe and say Polish people right. want to leave because they're anti-communist. We're like, hey, right. You know, we're anti-communists, but we really don't want you because yeah. you might be a secret communist. That's why you're fleeing from communism. So get out. But maybe we got to, I mean, it, it just, it's a very complicated kind of set of mental gymnastics that yeah. anti-immigrant people are trying to maintain. It's a lot of things coming together at once. It's, it's the nativism mm -hmm. that we see so much in our American history of just like, those people are different. They could be subversive. You know, we have a lot of, it's still very anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm anti-Catholic to some degree still during this time. But then you have, yeah, this cross current of, oh, but we're fighting this ideological war. Right. We want people to come who don't this want communism. This is the Statue of Liberty. And yeah. it's, it's been recast not as, you know, a, a, a monument from France about the Enlightenment, but it's this, you know, wretched refuse beacon. Yeah. And this is also during the time, and, you know, we also imagine that we've always thought of ourselves as a nation of immigrants. The 1950s is when that mythology actually becomes begins getting born. And it's during these debates, right? So right. people are fighting against these McCarthyist forces, these sort of xenoph continued xenophobia. And they're saying, hey, look, like everyone who's here in this country came because of some immigrant, you know, their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents. Let's begin to celebrate that history. And you see JFK writing a pamphlet called The Nation of Immigrants. You see actually immigration historians. This is a new area of history and study. So let's, well, let's talk first about JFK because I'm, I'm half Italian and I'm half Irish mm -hmm. and I, dis, I just dislike JFK in general. And he is a minor figure in this, um, in your book, but an interesting one because the Kennedys were Irish. They were Irish Catholic and that was, you know, part of their identity, but they kind of fudged that as much as they could because to be Irish and Catholic in the early part of the 20th century wasn't necessarily a social benefit. Yeah, as you were saying, he puts his name on a pamphlet, mm -hmm. um, but he also, he voted for the uh, McCarran-Walter Act, which was this anti-communist kind of anti-immigrant act. And then he voted when Truman, Tr Truman vetoed it and Congress overrode the veto. Right. What's going on with Jack Kennedy and how does, how does the Kennedy you know, experience of John F. Kennedy going from being kind of a wannabe Boston Brahmin, blue mm -hmm. blood, you know, oh, I, like maybe I came over on the Mayflower to being kind of aggressively Irish Catholic. What does that say about what's going on in, in post-war America? He's a fat, JFK is fascinating in all this, right? Because he basically... And also because not only did he not write the pamphlet, he probably never even read it, just like... I, he may have reviewed it. It's not It's not clear, but yeah. like some of his other works, yeah. which I won't get right. into, you know, there's some questions around yeah. how closely he was, you know, the pen, he put the pen to paper. Is, yeah, let's not get too technical. But politically, yeah. it's a big moment yeah. for him mm -hmm. because he's launching this career and being a Kennedy, he's got a lot of money, but he's very young doesn't actually have a lot of experience, but he launches his career out of Boston. He runs for Congress. And there's this great moment I remember finding in this oral history of, of, of an Italian-American who worked in his campaign where he shows up in the district that he wants to represent. He barely knows this district, really, okay? His, his grandparents grew up in these, you know, tiny streets of the North End, but JFK 
is from Palm Beach. He's like, he's, he doesn't know his way around the North End of the I think you point out that when he, when he lived in England, when his father was the ambassador to the UK, he didn't even visit. He doesn't Ireland. even go to Ireland. Yeah. This idea that they're right. Irish is like, yeah. they, they've really tried to sort of wasp over right. the whole thing. So this, this Italian-American is taking him around the North End, and JFK clearly has just never been there, doesn't, or barely, barely knows it. But he's got to convince all these people in these working class Irish Italian neighborhoods to vote for him. And so suddenly he now, this whole thing that his family has been trying to sort of paper over and sort of, I'd argue, really make as like a minor footnote in who they are, now has to come to the fore because if he wants to get elected, he's got to relate to these people. And he does have this incredible family history with his mom's father, Honey Fitz, who was a mayor of Boston, sort of a beloved you know, Irish American figure. And so JFK has to sort of bring himself closer to that part of his family and sort of, I would argue, make himself seem more Irish to attract these people. And one of the best ways that you can signal to ethnic voters that I'm on your side is through immigration policy. And to say, I see your family, these are immigrants, and I'm going to try to change the law so that more of your relatives can come, more people like you. you. You all make this country great. And so he begins from that point on to really make immigration part of his platform. And at the early times, so he votes for the McCarran-Walter Act because he also is quite hawkish on communism. You know, his father is friends with McCarthy himself. He is pretty, you know... Uh, let's let's go a little bit deeper. Uh, Robert Kennedy worked for Joe McCarthy. Joe yes. McCarthy is the godparent of his... Yes, uh, the family is very yeah. tied to McCarthy. But, and, and very, I mean, but very anti-communist. Yes, and again, it's yeah. these, it's these, it's this Irish Catholic yeah. connection yeah. that McCarthy, they have. McCarthy, uh, you know, it's funny. I, uh, you know, obviously Catholic, but I, I'm kind of like, I don't want him to be an Irish Catholic. <laughs> he's, he's from the Midwest. But these are like up and coming yeah. Irish Catholic right. politicians, right? And so Joe Kennedy Senior, I, I would think, probably thinks that McCarthy is just he's one of them. They're right. power hungry Irish Catholics who want, you know, power in Washington, and they're very anti communist. And JFK's political ideas, I'd also argue at this time, are kind of fuzzy. Mm -hmm. But on this, he's very clear. He's very anti communist. He's very into foreign policy. But he slowly has to learn about immigration policy. And so this is why he writes this pamphlet. When he gets to the White House, he's run on this as well, that he wants to overturn these quotas. So he begins to actually put forward legislation dealing with this. Right. Now, of course, he's assassinated, but I'd argue that if he had not put forward this legislation and then LBJ doesn't run with it, we wouldn't have had these reforms too. Before we get to that act and his brother, then Ted Kennedy, uh, yes. has a big role in, in the 1965 act. Um, but you mentioned historians in the 50s kind of remaking America, recasting the American narrative as an immigrant narrative. Um, Oscar Hanlon is one of the historians that you write a lot about or you talk a lot about. What was his role in, and you know, in this is something I, you know, it happens all the time where we think, you know, that uh, America has always been this way. Uh, you know, the American Renaissance, the uh, supposed flowering of letters in the early 19th century, particularly in Boston, was something that was created in the 1920s and 30s right. by a couple of right. literary historians. In a similar way, Oscar Hanlon kind of recreates America, casts it back as an, uh, an immigrant story. Who was he and what, how did he transform the way we talk about America. So Oscar Hannon is, is Jewish, family is from Eastern Europe, and he essentially is the father of this whole idea of um, American immigration history. He writes, I'm paraphrasing, but in, in the beginning of The Brooded, which was a very popular book at the time, won a Pulitzer, he basically says, I set out to learn American history, and what I learned is American history is the history of American immigrants, that you can't study American history without looking at the immigrant experience as being core to being American. Before this, you know, I was reading recently, our idea of what that mythology was was sort of the American West, that that was the foundational idea of what, of what we are as a nation. But Oscar Hanlon really makes it into, no, no, it's not just the West, it's immigrants. And he really, he writes this book, The Uprooted, which is an unusual book. It's a very strange work of history. It basically is a sort of lyrically written book talking about sort of the experience of immigrants, the very difficult experience that immigrants have when they come to this country, that it's quite hard to assimilate and to adjust and make a life here. He also, though, is not just a historian. He is also politically active. So when Truman is furious that the McCarran-Walter Act passes, 
and starts a commission saying, let's figure out how to get rid of this whole law. You know, we don't, it just passed, but let's try to get rid of it. Handlin is involved in that too. So he's not only studying the history and popularizing the history, he's also involved in discussions of, hey, that 19, these 1920s quotas are anti, like they're un-American and we need to change them. And, and he's part of that effort. So they're fusing and, and, a and, political I mean, effort with this mythology. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that is a, a brilliant rhetorical gesture because in fact, that wasn't un-American. It was kind of the quintessence of America to be restrictionist. And he's saying, no, keeping people out merely because they come from bad countries, that is what's un-American. Yeah. It's like it's new nationalism, yeah. right? I think we tend to think of nationalism as closing off the right. borders, but because of this new idea of a nation of immigrants, this phrase, mm -hmm that people like Hanlon and JFK put forward, there's a new nationalism, right? That like what makes us great as a country is that we are we are descended from immigrants. And, but this idea is only for the 1950s, but it begins to really become politically powerful. So it's deployed, it doesn't quite win the day in the 1952 debate with the McCarran-Walter Act, but by the time you get to 65, the, the intervening years, this idea takes on greater and greater power and basically propels this reform through. Yeah. So now let's talk about Emanuel Seller, because this is a guy who, as a congressman, it's like he was, you know, when the Pilgrim showed up, he was already in office and he, he lasted all the way through the early Watergate period. I mean, yes. this, I mean, literally he was in office from what, Party. like the 19, yeah, so the 20s mm -hmm. to the early 70s, yes. right? And he is really kind of the hero of this book. He's, he is also in many ways the hero of, of Daniel O'Krent's The Guarded Gate. I mean, he is, you know, I mean, he's a fascinating figure. And talk about him as we move to a discussion of the 1965 reform that really is, is still the immigration policy, yeah, more or less, that we're living with. But Emanuel Seller. Manny Seller is a total product of immigrant America, right? And he is the grandson of German Jewish immigrants from the mid 1800s. So there's a big wave of German and Irish immigration mid 1800s, followed by, you know, again the Italians, Eastern Europe. And there was also Jews. earlier there was that the kind of Nordic, Scandinavian. Uh, yes. Swedes for a while were like the most popular immigrant group, which is yes kind of hilarious. Yes, and all these groups, yeah. right, successfully assimilate yeah. and we just sort of take for granted, right. but like he's from that wave, right. right? And what's interesting is that there's a real distinction among Jewish immigrants and children of immigrants between the German Jews and the Eastern European ones who come later. Manny Seller represents this district in Brooklyn that is just filled with immigrants, right? People from all over Europe. When he's elected and someone says, you know, where are your constituents from? He points to a map of Europe and says, they're from Europe. It's this is from all over. And he loves that. He loves that that's Brooklyn. It's his family. And so when he gets into Congress, right away, these, these 1920s quotas are passed and he's horrified. He's a very young congressman. He kind of hates Washington at first because, you know, when you join the House at the beginning, you have no power. You're put on these nothing subcommittees. And so he really has to slowly work his way up. But his tenure in Congress, which goes from you know, he joins when Harding is the president all the way to Nixon. Basically, he he sees the entire thing change on immigration from start to finish, right? And he's a big part of it. He actually is the reason, a big reason why the laws change. So through the Holocaust and World War II, he's fighting to open up the borders war for refugees. Through the 50s and that big fight, he's fighting. And then through the 60s, he never stops fighting because in his mind, it's people like his family, it's his constituents. The laws are basically insulting and unjust because they say your type of people are inferior to the wasps and the Nordics that we want. And he basically spends his entire legislative career trying to change these laws. So what happened um, in the early 60s? Uh, you know, and part of it is Kennedy, you know, identifies as an immigrant and then Kennedy gets assassinated. But what, what are the kind of political steps or the things that have to happen that then we get to a major reform in the mid-60s? So when JFK dies, his entire legislative agenda comes back to life under the hands of LBJ. So this is beyond, imagine it's not just immigration, right? It's really all of the great society reforms that LBJ puts forward. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, it's all kind of swept in through all of that. And essentially, by the time you get to the 60s, the groundwork has been laid for these changes. And so in a way, people aren't attending to the details of it that much. It's taken on so much symbolism. It's this idea of, we're a nation of immigrants, right? That mythology is established now. And oh, these, these quotas are so racist we can't have them. We can't tell Italians and Jews, people are, who are part of the Democratic base, right, at this point. 
And the GOP wants these weapons. We can't tell these people that they're in fear. So we have to change these laws. So by the time LBJ comes in and is sort of looking at the unfinished legislative agenda of JFK, immigration is on that list and he gets behind it. It's not his biggest priority. And it doesn't seem to occupy that much, uh, you know, mind share, right, uh, yeah. of the population. One of the ways that Ted Kennedy, who ended up being one of the major pushers of the bill, was saying that, okay, we're shifting from country of origin as the big determinant to family reunification. Yeah. What, um, you know, what, what, how, why is that a better selling point? And then what kind of happens with that? So they're d debating the details, right? And one of the things they talk about is, well, when you look at priority of who gets to come in, if you're not going to have open borders, you still have to say, like, who's, who's ahead in line? To get the more sort of anti-immigrant forces on board with this, these people are saying, well, these laws seem a little bit liberal to us. I mean, we don't want people from Asia and Africa and all these other people. So what if we, to restrict that, we just sort of said, if you're already here and you have a family member who's, you know, your sister, your parent who wants to come, that person can come and they have priority. And if we do that, everyone's European here. That will keep the immigrants more or less European. This we now know of as chain migration, right? The Trump administration talks about this all the time, or family reunification. What they don't anticipate is that that is the very mechanism that accelerates non-white immigration. Because it turns out that most of the Europeans who wanted to come here were kind of already here. Right. So, so it, it, it wasn't helping. I mean, I uh, you know, it wasn't helping... Are we going to bring grandma or a great aunt from, you know, County Cork over? It right. turns into something very different. And you have to remember, in 1965, immigration history in the U.S. is European. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't fathom immigration coming from around the world the way we do people flying into JFK airport. Like, we can't. That's not our view. If you think of immigration, you think, oh, it's European immigration. What, they, what people don't notice is that even already by the mid-1960s, you're seeing more Asian immigration than before. It's very, very low levels compared to now. But, you know, we have refugee laws that are letting people in during the Vietnam War, right? We begin to allow more Asian immigrants during the Cold War. So little by little, there are more Asian immigrants coming in. And once you have family reunification, that number really begins to explode. But a lot of it's just understanding that if you're someone in 1965, immigration is European. We've always been a European country. And so that's why they don't really foresee how these laws are going to just transform American demographics and, forever. And there's fewer immigration uh, immigrants, right? In yes. 1970, the percentage of foreign-born population is under 5%. It's the lowest amount that it's ever been because immigration was stopped both by world events but especially by immigration policy. Yeah. So it seemed like there's more kind of room to give uh, yeah. because if it's only five percent of the population as opposed to 15 you know what's a couple more you know people non-english speaking exactly people. it's a symbolic idea right and it's also that then this idea of a nation of immigrants is a mythology from the past in a way right it's not a going concern because when you cut off immigration the way we did in the 20s i mean the numbers just plummet and so essentially all these immigrants who come in from eastern they almost assimilate more deeply into being white Americans. Sure. And right now, right, we don't think of in the 20s, if you're Italian or Jewish, you're considered not quite white. And now we take for granted that people, you know, they're all considered white. But all of that, that sort of consolidation of whiteness is happening during this time, too. So there's odd paradoxes going on, too. As, as, as the percentage of foreign born shrinks, uh, people feel more comfortable asserting an ethnic identity as being you know, what makes you American is not that you're on the Mayflower, but it said, oh, I'm an Italian American or I'm a black African American. I'm an, a Native American. After 1970, uh, things start to explode again. The number of immigrants uh, or percentage of the population foreign born starts growing, especially from places like Mexico. Explain where, how does Mexico fit into all of this? Because it is odd, like we talk about Asia and Europe um, and Mexico Mexicans actually had a free reign coming in and out of the country up until the mid-60s. Yeah. Mexican immigration is wildly different from how we think of it today. We essentially had open borders. You know, we had a literacy test on all of our borders, but really if you could, again, physically make that journey and get your two feet onto U.S. soil, you were fine. Again, no visas, no long waiting lists. People could just come. And again, it's part of our foreign policy. So the idea is in the Western Hemisphere, we have all these neighbors. It would be insulting or not very neighborly 
to have restrictions. And so there are no quotas, there are no numerical limitations, even through the 1920s, through that all that restriction on Europe and Asia, Western Hemisphere is just totally open. We don't, we don't have any limits, essentially. And so if you want to, there's no limit on how many people from Mexico can come. The 1960s come around, and this becomes part of the debate, which is, what do we do? We have this whole system in place for outside the Western Hemisphere, right? We have quotas, we have a numerical cap. We're going to get rid of these sort of this racist ranking of people, but we're still going to have a numerical cap. But what about the Western Hemisphere? Why do we treat that differently? And some of the more anti-immigrant people said, essentially, well, that seems discriminatory in a funny way to have one set of rules for the Western Hemisphere and another for Europe and the rest of the world. And so they then add a numerical cap for the very first time on immigration from other countries in the Western Hemisphere, including Mexico. And overnight, that changes how we think about immigrants from Mexico, right? Suddenly, there's a numerical cap, which means that there's a lot more room for illegal immigration. So suddenly, things that were considered perfectly legal and normal take on this label of illegal. And May Nye, the historian, has done a lot of work on this. So, uh, yeah, one of, one of the things that is kind of hard to understand is that the government can assert a law, but, you know, you're, you're talking about a kind of arbitrary border, and people don't stop coming simply because it's, you know, it's within or without the law. So starting in, you know, ab- in the 70s and into the 80s, because this becomes a big issue under Ronald Reagan, there's a huge influx of Mexicans in particular, as well as Asian immigrants. How does this, um, you know, what what happens as, you know, once the 1965 Act and that is put into place and we start seeing a ramp up again of immigration, how, how did Ronald Reagan um, deal with immigration? He basically has a, you know, the ma- last major truly ambitious reworking of American immigration laws comes under Reagan. And he basically creates a path to citizenship for all these people. He creates amnesty. And that is supposed to basically try to, I mean, everyone was always trying to solve immigration once and for all. This is his pass at that. Of course, that doesn't quite work. Um, I'd argue the next pass at this under Bill Clinton is at least as transformative. I think in the moment it wasn't considered as ambitious as what Reagan did, but Bill Clinton is the one who really creates this idea of, I would argue, a sort of perpetual state of illegal immigration crisis because he narrows, he both narrows the pathways to citizenship and increases the reasons to deport people. And so you put that all together and you basically keep changing the rules so that fewer people can come and stay and more people can be deported, which again, if you look at the history we don't. We just weren't deporting people, right? So if you come here and you make a life here, no one is coming into your door and saying you're out of here. That's again a very modern concept. Yeah, and and to go first Reagan, and then let's talk about Clinton because we're we're living in the the long shadow of that. Yeah, Reagan. Uh, there's, I mean, there's tremendous footage from a 1980 debate between George H. W. Bush and Ronald Reagan where they're debating in Houston. They're still slugging it out for the Republican nomination. And there's a debate where they are outdoing each other of who would be more welcoming to illegal immigrants who they have, they say are part of, absolutely part of American culture, the workforce. We need to be welcoming them. Wow. It's like, you know, I mean, it's like from an alternate timeline in yeah. Man in the High Castle or something. Uh, Reagan overnight signs legislation that ultimately allows millions of illegals to enter the country yeah. with some restrictions because that's, you know, the, it becomes harder for workers, uh, 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 rather employers, to employ illegals. Like there are sanctions put against that. But things kind of set there. Then in the mid 90s, uh, and you know, you're talking about Bill Clinton, like illegal immigration becomes a big, big issue. And he responds by making it easier to deport people. Yes. And this whole idea of law enforcement and immigration you know, it's really just ramping up more and more and more, right? Because again, if we step back, basically an open border with Mexico, no visas, no passports. Every successive stage, right, in the last hundred years, we keep adding bureaucracy, paperwork, more and more restrictions. And so not only to who can come in, but we say you can be deported too, right? You, you, Even if you show up, and you've been here for a long time, you have a family here, we can come in and say, you need to leave right now. And that is all relatively new. 
And that, you know, that built up under uh, George W. Bush, who was actually rhetorically was extremely friendly to, to immigrants. And he did, you know, in 2004, he had two big agenda items after winning re-election. One was Social Security privatization and the other was immigration reform. He got his ass kicked by everybody, but especially his own party. Um, uh, Barack Obama deported even more people yes. by any measure than George Bush did. Yes. Um, what is going on with that? Like, because not, you know, both, I mean, neither of these guys seem to be like, oh, we're xenophobic. Uh, yeah. Bush was the first president, in, I don't know, like ever who spoke Spanish. He was, as governor of Texas, he welcomed illegal immigrants as part of the workforce. Yeah. What's, what's going on? I mean, I think part of it is that we are not grappling with how much our immigration has changed. I mean, again, if we think about the history, it's all European, it's assimilation, it's the sort of gauzy nation of immigrants. What we haven't, I think, really grappled with is the question of race on immigration, just how non-white all this immigration is. And I think and, and that again, it's... again, when you say non-white, it's, you know, if, if Mexicans aren't considered white in another 20 or 30 years, something is will be very strange. Because, I mean, but it is true, so the... the sources of immigration starting to come from Latin America and then from Asia, including India. Yeah. This this is the issue, you think? That I think part is, of it know. is that we, we, we don't always understand that the immigration we're seeing now is just, just as in the 20s, mm -hmm. the, the Italians who came and the Russian Jews who came seemed really different, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't just look different. They worshiped differently. They ate different food. They dressed differently. I think there that when that happens there's room for a lot of nativists to say hey who are these people they don't speak english they're not like us they're different can they assimilate it's the same questions of assimilation mm -hmm. but unlike previous generations where the assimilation was from europeans these are people from around the world these are many many more countries coming in yeah and now the i mean the main people main sending countries really are uh, china or from asia including india then yes. then from even latin america much yes. less europe fastest growing um, racial group right now is Asian American. Yeah. And so all of this is happening. And I don't know if, I don't know that people are necessarily sensing mm -hmm. that, you know, in a statistical way right. that they know it. But I think that that, if someone wants to make a xenophobic argument, there's room to do that. Right. Because if you look around, our country is really changing pretty dramatically. And you add, you know, a financial crisis and mm -hmm. economic instability, all these things put together, I'd argue, make it easier for there to be anti immigrant policies. It makes it easier to say we need to deport people, we need to sort of crack down because there is this other, right? These people are coming and they are the other and they need to be treated in a certain way um, and we need to be tough on them and tough on crime and all of that I think both Democrats and Republicans have embraced and to your point, like yeah, as recently as the 80s, we were still acting very welcoming and I'd also add a lot of employers have always wanted immigrants. Sure. I mean, they are a huge, I haven't mentioned this, but like in all these debates, the big farms out in the Southwest, all of the companies are always saying, open up the borders, open because they want this sort of cheaper labor at all times. We started by talking about your personal connection to this. Yeah, let's end with that. So you, you mentioned that not even everybody in your, uh, you know, kind of extended family is pro-immigrant. How, do, how does your family talk about Americanness? And is it um, how linked is it to being white or not, or, you know, where, where's that conversation? Going? Cause one of the things where, you know, in this super woke moment where in a way it, it would seem the cruelest thing you could do because, you know, one, one noisy rhetoric is that America is the most extremely racist country in the world. Like, why would you ever want to bring somebody from, you know, Myanmar here? Because then they would really experience awful repression. But I, I you know, what is the conversation that's playing out, uh, you know, in your family discussions of this? I think, I mean, we've always thought of my, so the parents, my parents and my aunts and uncles who came are, you know, they are like the ones who made the yeah. journey, right? And I think, you know, they love this country. And we've all kind of adopted this idea that this country took us in, allowed us to really make our lives here. And I think that they look at Trump's rhetoric and they are, nervous about it because it seems like we thought that this the country wanted immigrants and suddenly we seem to not want them. Um, at the same time, I think, you know, like a lot of immigrant families, I don't know that my family has a very clear sense of, well, who should be allowed after we've come in, mm -hmm. right? Like, should people at the border be allowed in? Under these circumstances, you know, I think there's also the sense of like, 
we follow these rules. Some people aren't following the rules. For me, what I learned from this book essentially is that the rules keep changing. <laughs> and so this idea that you follow the rules or your family followed the rules, your grandparents did, and now this person isn't, I'm not sure that's a fair comparison because if you just look at how much we've transformed the entire sort of government infrastructure around immigration, it doesn't remotely resemble probably what your parents or grandparents or great-grandparents went through. And for me, I mean, I've talked to my parents. My parents didn't know any of this history either. And so I think, I hope this is a little bit of a wake-up call for people whose families have come more recently that essentially, you know, your family was allowed here, but it's only because of these political struggles and these laws and people had to fight for them. And in, in a way, they're kind of inadvertently allowing your family in because they didn't plan on letting in these many Asian Americans. But all of this is changing all the time. It's subject to change, right? As we learn in Nazi Germany, unfortunately, one day you can be a citizen and the next day you're not a citizen. These are all legal categories well, and, and political and then categories. And Reagan flips that from yes. one day you're an illegal immigrant, the next day you're a citizen. Right. So, Who's to say yeah. that, you know, you will always be legal permanently, right. you and your family, and who's to say that you will be illegal, right? So I think we tend to, in our debates, treat these labels as very fixed and immutable, both historically and just sort of legally, like this is the law. But what I learned from doing this book is that the laws are changing all the time. We, we decide as a, as a democracy who can be a citizen, who can enter the country, and we can rewrite those laws all over again. And we have, right? We've gone from very open borders to not open borders at all. We're in the middle of doing that now with the Trump White House, right? They're trying to reduce not just illegal, but legal immigration and green card visas. And we might see demographic changes all over again. But essentially, all of this is fluid. Um, none of it is fixed. And we should all, I, I imagine, I think we should think of all of our families as being part of this very changing idea of how much we are a nation of immigrants. In the two months following my conversation with Yang, there have been early signs that the COVID-19 pandemic could have a major effect on U.S. immigration policy, including Trump's executive order temporarily halting legal migration, a delay in asylum hearings on the Mexican border, and a Centers for Disease Control and Prevention order blocking entry of migrant children that invokes a 1940s era law. I started by asking Yang whether she thinks COVID-19 will have a long-lasting impact on immigration policy. Why has the coronavirus lockdown made a book about immigration, of all things, more relevant than it would have been before? Right, because none of us are traveling anywhere, migrating anywhere. It's quite the opposite. So I think there's at least two reasons. One early on that struck me was, you know, because this virus was being called the Chinese virus by the president, it immediately had this sort of ethnic racial quality to it. And that was that immediately set off a lot of xenophobia. And in fact, there's xenophobia all around the world from this pandemic, but in the US, that version of xenophobia is specifically anti-Asian. And you, we've seen people, um, everything from, you know, they're standing in line, Asian Americans standing in line at the grocery store, minding their own business, getting supplies like everybody else needs, and someone saying something racist to them, um, people being physically attacked, spat on, you know, children being bullied and being called a Chinese virus. So that immediately began happening uh, in March, there were reports of this. So this really, for me, revealed kind of the tenuous political standing of Asian Americans yet again. Mm -hmm. And this idea of, are Asian Americans part of America? And this whole story and history of how there came to be so many Asian Americans in this country in the first place. And to me, the missing piece in that conversation, which sort of goes around and around in circles is, you have to understand the history of how all these Asian immigrants came here to begin with to understand, I would argue, why our political position is so tenuous because the 1965 law, right, it's almost like a backdoor entry. It wasn't explicitly designed to admit this many Asian immigrants and yet here all of us are. And everyone feels, not everyone, but like many people feel like, oh, we've assimilated, we fit in. And it takes a xenophobic moment like this to remind everyone, oh, wait a second, I still look Asian. I still don't really fit in. I'm still considered foreign. What's going on there? And I just think you can't really answer that question without knowing the literal like political history of why there's so many Asian Americans. So that's the first reason. Okay. Uh, do you do you think this is uh, calls back to perhaps uh, previous moments of xenophobia, 
uh, you know, against German Americans or German things in America during, uh, it would have been the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, 1919 in World War I? So the closest analogy that I've come across um, is the bubonic plague scare from the early 1900s. So when this hit, this specifically in San Francisco, this was where the fear was concentrated. This was, of course, after Congress had already passed the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, but there was still a very, you know, very robust Chinatown community in San Francisco. And the plague immediately became associated with Chinese immigrants. And it played on all these stereotypes about Chinese immigrants being dirty, being unhygienic, unsanitary. And the city responded in an extraordinarily racist way. They basically, um, you know, forced these communities to be under lockdown. They began to force people to get vaccinations, which during this time were, you know, this is a very early time for vaccinations. They were really terrifying to get. They weren't the way that we get them now, just a simple shot. And they banned people from leaving, Chinese immigrants from leaving their communities without getting vaccinated. So there was actually a court case about this and a federal judge said, you can't actually, this violates the 14th amendment. You can't forcibly vaccinate people and prevent them from leaving their neighborhood. This is, this is illegal. Mm -hmm. But it really unleashed this incredibly, specifically anti-Asian backlash and it wrapped in all these stereotypes about you know, these immigrants. And there was already anti-immigration laws pertaining to Chinese people, but the, the plague and the fear of it certainly exacerbated all that. Do you, uh, do you think that the um, coronavirus then will um, have a direct and immediate effect on immigration policy? You're talking about a kind of cultural moment now. Whenever Congress fully gets back to operating and whatnot, do you think um, it'll, it'll be on the, uh, the legislative agenda to change immigration policy? I do. And I think you know, I can't predict that, but I think that there are a lot of reasons to think that that's more possible now. So the first would be, you already see the Trump White House through executive order taking pretty dramatic action, right? Trump has already suspended temporarily for now, family-based immigration, they're not issuing you green cards. They haven't tampered with the temporary worker visa situation because, you know, our farms depend on that. Like, mm -hmm. there's too much affected, but really... And, the and there also people, seems, there also seems to be... Um, uh, some uh, uh, interest in having more foreign medical where uh, medical care workers or healthcare workers coming right from right. The Philippines so certain certain areas of workers we want, but sort of the core like legal immigration, especially the chain migration that Stephen Miller is really against. Mm -hmm. That that the heart of our legal immigration system. He's already told conservative supporters we're using the this pandemic as a pretext to advance our broader immigration agenda. And I think that not only is that going to have um, more traction because of the anti-Asian fears, the xenophobia, the fact that this virus originated in Wuhan, but also the economy. So we know from our history that when our economy really takes a turn for the worse, and that is a wild understatement as to what we're going through now, there's an immediate turn to saying, well, how do we protect our American workers? We've got to get rid of immigrants. So if you look at the Great Depression, which, you know, we could, we are already at Great Depression levels, you could argue in some states like Nevada, we're already at 25% unemployment, and there's no sign of it ending. Mm -hmm. You know, during the Great Depression, Hoover did mass deportations of Mexican immigrants and American born Mexican Americans. And that was, you know, it didn't, didn't do anything to help the economy. There's no, you know, deporting people are, is not going to bring back jobs. We have a pandemic. That's why people don't have jobs. But um, that was an easy thing to argue for politically, because if you're worried about your job, if you're worried about competition, you know, the administration can clearly argue and Republicans can argue. Anyone who wants to anti-immigration can say, right. look, it's not race. It's the economy. We can't, we can't spare, you know, we can't have this competition here. We need to help Americans get jobs again and look at those immigrants you know, they pose an economic threat. So I just think between just the, the like, you know, the, uh, the inherent xenophobia that a global pandemic can unleash, there's the economic argument that you could make now too, saying our economy simply can't afford to have this many immigrants. 
Could you uh, perhaps compare and contrast the current moment to that moment in the early 20s when the restrictionists, after decades of, of working hard to you know, lock down the, the borders, finally were able to pass it? In the, in the teens and 20s, people were much less timid about being openly racist, but they also oftentimes did try to make larger arguments than simple, basic uh, kind of xenophobia or racism. Now it's, you know, it's hard to do that. Do you think we'll see an op- a return to kind of open racism uh, as a result of this? I think actually the, the people in the 20s who argued for it were in some ways quite sophisticated in how they, hmm. uh, you know, supported, constructed arguments supporting these ethnic quotas they already in the 20s knew that they would be called racist and were called racist and took offense to that. And so their argument, which I think you see white nationalists trot out all the time, and I think it's a very, again, sophisticated argument, or more sophisticated than just saying I'm racist, would be to say, I'm not racist. I'm not saying that some races are inferior or, or superior to others. I just want to keep America, America. Implication being, I want to keep America white and Anglo Saxon. So, you know, Jews, Jews are fine. Chinese people are fine. I don't have anything wrong with them, but they need to stay with their people and we need to keep our people a certain way. So I think if you look over the years, every time there's a nativist, you know, debate around, you know, should we allow people of this ethnicity here or not? There is this way that the people who support the nativists will say like, I'm not, I'm not racist. I'm just saying, let's keep things homogeneous. Let's keep stability, right? That's another word that comes up. We have to keep our democracy stable. Introducing foreign elements is a destabilizing force, and we shouldn't do that. And so I think in a moment like this, again, you could argue we can't, just imagine you can make this nativist argument, right? And not sound quite as overtly racist. You could say, well, we've got a pandemic. Our economy is in free fall. Our society is coming apart at the seams. We simply just can't afford to take in people who, you know, they could say these people don't speak English, they don't have money when they come, they're gonna be a burden on our social welfare. So, you know, you can make, you can imagine making all these arguments that don't, you know, again, don't sound overtly racist. And when society is under pressure the way we are now, you could you can imagine a lot of Americans sort of nodding along saying, yeah, now is not the time for more immigrants. Do you, uh, do you think that labor uh, and some elements of the Democratic Party, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say that the Republican Party is, is openly racist in it when, it when it is anti-immigrant. And obviously there's a section of the Republican Party that has always been very pro-immigrant. Um, but does the economic argument now or the, or the economic reality, uh, you're right, you know, the, the economy is shrinking. We don't know how far we know, you know, we're looking at conceivably 10 or 20 percent unemployment nationally. Um, do you think that's going to embolden, uh, uh, you know, maybe more Democratic Party or left wing populists to flex against immigration? I don't really know, honestly. I, I mean, it's a good question because I think the Democratic Party generally has just been incredibly muddled on immigration. I, I could not tell you what Joe Biden's platform is on this. I mean, I think the Democratic Party for a while has just under Trump has just said, we don't want to separate families. That's inhumane. We love immigrants. We're not racist. That's kind of the pitch. I, I, right. I don't see them. I mean, you saw Julian Castro, you know, in his short lived campaign, I think actually put forward a pretty ambitious uh, full, full throated immigration policy platform, but I haven't really seen that from the Biden campaign or the Democratic Party leadership in Congress. So I don't really know. And I think, I think the left wing populists, I mean, I think they are going to, you know, what they've been arguing for, for a while now, right, is a new deal style uh, policy platform. And they were already arguing for that before the pandemic. You're hearing it again. I don't know. None of that is gaining traction on the Hill for all the dollar right. dollar amounts of these stimulus packages. Yeah. There, you know, a lot of it's a corporate yeah, we've got, what, actually, almost three tr- the, Yeah, we've got like $3 trillion in new spending and nobody really quite knows where it's going, right? Exactly. This is not, whatever it is, it's not the new deal. Come yeah. back to life. Yeah. So, I imagine the left is going to keep arguing for a return to the New Deal, just as they were already doing. People like, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right. people who are trying to sort of revive that part of the Democratic Party tradition. And I just, I don't think they've thought through how to deal with immigration, too. I mean, again, Hoover, you know, infamously failed 
to help the country during the Great Depression, right? He deported Mexicans that, that did nothing, obviously, to help the economy. What the economy needed was, you know, Keynesian stimulus of money. That's, that's well, what well, well, we'll argue about whether it needed Keynesian stimu- stimulus, <laughs> but, <laughs> but definitely, definitely it needed more in terms of demand. And you're not, you're not going to yes. yeah, grow demand by getting rid of people. So. Exactly. So yeah. again, here we are. And the demand that's coming is not real demand. It appears to be something of a giveaway that sort of, um, Slipping through everyone's fingers, no one can, no one who needs the money yeah. is getting it. Or very right. few are, which are right small businesses. And then immigration, you know, they can turn to that as a boogeyman. So right. it does feel a little bit like the earlier moments of the Great Depression, where no one quite knew how to respond. One of the uh, one of the large points of your book, and and in our you know in our original interview, which wasn't that long ago, but it does seem like it took place on another planet, um, really. But you you noted that. Um, the changing of the immigration rules and laws in 1965 was primarily a function of elites. It wasn't, uh, there was no groundswell of, you know, we, you know, among the people demanding politicians change this. And there wasn't even much discussion or understanding or, or kind of fisking of what the implications would be. Do you think any changes to immigration policy now will those be driven by populist, you know, will it, will it be bottom up or will it be top down? a good question. I think, you know, one reason why it used to be more top down, I'd argue, is because foreign policy was much, was a much bigger part of it. So during the Cold War, presidents, one president after another, both Democrats and Republicans, you know, Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, LBJ, JFK, they all felt like during the Cold War, in an ideological battle where the U.S. was supposed to be, you know, a greater moral force than the Soviet Union, this immigration law, the quota system was just immoral and indefensible and therefore a foreign policy liability. And you could see all the refugee laws, right, that were passed and the carve outs from executive orders for certain, you know, like the Cuban refugees, right? Those were all, those were all immigration steps taken to advance American foreign policy ideas. And now that foreign policy, I, I rarely hear about it as part of our domestic debate. It feels very driven by you know, domestic racial politics, um, economic fears. You don't really hear someone saying, whoa, 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 we can't offend, you know, Latin America because that is against our foreign policy. That I, I, I don't even hear Democrats making that argument. I mean, Julian Castro, again, actually did kind of bring foreign policy into it, but I, I haven't heard anyone do that in a long time hmm. otherwise. So I do think because of that, I imagine the forces shaping our immigration policy have already felt to me more bottom up. Because even though Trump is the one kind of exerting it through executive order, to me, he's reading the cues of his supporters, right? He's playing to his rally crowds. He's playing to, I think, an environment of fear around immigration, around our economy and the stability of our society. So I don't think that there is a groundswell of anti-immigration feeling in this country. If you look at polling, actually most Americans feel like immigrants make the country better. But I think there's just enough of an element from the bottom up, kind of egging on Trump, that he feeds off of too, that he's responding to that versus, you know, a sense of diplomacy or America's place in the world, which is, you know, in my reading from the 20th century, that's a lot of what presidents were responding to. For the immigrants who stay here, how does that affect their their um, sense of Americanness? Um, and do they, you know, is is there a predictable response, kind of a, a large response to that? Do they become more American? Do they try to be super American, or do they become kind of exiles in in their new home country? This has come up in the whole debate about how to respond to the anti Asian xenophobia. Mm-hmm. So I'll just take off that piece of it. I mean, Andrew Yang, the the Mm. former presidential candidate, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post that was widely criticized, but the the argument basically was, we are now held under suspicion by our fellow citizens, and the best way to deal with that is to become more American, essentially, Mm. to show that we're really American by being part of the solution to the pandemic, you know, really just showing that we love this country. We're not foreign and strange. We're not a threat. We're here to, we're here to help. Mm. And I think there's a, there's a long history of Asian Americans trying to do that. To me, the most fascinating would be after the Japanese Americans were placed in internment camps during World War II, people literally volunteered to yeah. die in World War II to prove that they belonged. Yeah. And 
that moment actually dovetails with immigration history, oddly enough. So when they come back, you know, this was a time when Asian Americans, uh, Japanese Americans could not naturalize and become citizens. They were also practically all but banned from entering the country. And so people leveraged activists, Asian activists leveraged the sacrifices of World War II to win naturalization rights for all Asian immigrants, mm -hmm. which you know, was a huge watershed moment for, for Asian Americans, and to secure more immigration slots for Asians than had existed before. Mm -hmm. So that moment happened, but I, 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 I do feel like once you go down the road of, we're gonna prove that we're more American, I think that's a never ending kind of path to go down. And I do think what's interesting now about our country and our demographics is that you could argue that Jewish Americans, Italian Americans, I, I mean, every European immigrant group that comes, right? Everyone whose family's from Europe, every ethnic group at some point assimilated, right? Into, to be specific what that means, into being considered white Americans. Right. Yet most of the immigrants we have now are not European. You know, they really don't look white. Like my family, we don't look white. That's that's right. not what we look like. No. So what does assimilation look like then? And I think we were already wrestling with that. It's still a very new phenomenon that we have this many non-European immigrants. Yep. I don't know how far we were with that, but I can't imagine that a pandemic and the threat of social collapse is going to make yeah. going to make that easier. Although it's true that in moments of crisis and disaster, communities do come together. So I think there are these cross currents and it's yeah. just really to say. I, uh, you know, and I, I think uh, when I look back on it and I think about my own parents uh, who uh, were children of immigrants who grew up during the depression, my father fought in World War II as an Irish immigrant. Um, there's no question that, that participating in large numbers in World War II helped kind of make, you know, Irish and Italian, my, my uh, old, one of my uncles, fought, who was a firstborn generation born in America, fought in the invasion of Italy. Um, and so he's able to come back and say, look, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm an American, I right? I yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and then on top of that, so you have that kind of traumatic moment that actually allows people to, you know, put their life on the line to become American. And then you have a basically uninterrupted economic boom uh, so that the pie is getting bigger for everybody. And I don't think we have either of those uh, situations right now You're right. looking and, forward. And, yeah, and right, we are literally socially isolated. So I don't yeah. see, you know, I can see virtually that people are trying to help each other. People are, you right. know, honking their horns and coming out and banging in a pot. But I don't, yeah. I'm not like shoulder to shoulder with fellow right. Americans in the trenches of fighting the pandemic. And I think to come back to my earlier point, I mean, we have just a total economic collapse on our hands. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are already going hungry. I just don't think you, we can overstate just how catastrophic that side of it is. I mean, we are living through the Great Depression of some kind. The only question is, will it be worse than the Great Depression from the 30s? Yeah. And I, I don't think, I can't point to an incident in American history, at least, where financial and economic collapse led to you know, a kumbaya feeling <laughs> where everyone is like, oh, you're different from me. That's okay. You know, we can- We're everyone... all in it together. Yeah, right. that's, I mean, once you remove certainty and stability and you introduce a sense that, you know, essentially with this economic collapse, to me, what's striking is how sudden it was, right? It's like everyone is going about their business and then the sky just falls and nothing could be more, I think, just sort of destabilizing. I mean, your sense of, the sun will come up every day, like that is just taken away. And I think once people have that fear that they're not in control, that no one is in control, right? They're not in control. The government has not, I mean, their leaders have not stepped in to make them feel like things are under control. I just think when there's that sense of um, uncertainty, fear, just, you know, the idea that we don't know what tomorrow will bring, I think that it, those are conditions that in my mind, seem very ripe for more xenophobia, not less. Uh, well, I am, uh, 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 let's, I hate to end on that kind of note, but um, I think it's a powerful punctuation point. Uh, we've been talking with Gia Lin Yang. She is a Nash, deputy national editor at the New York Times and the author of the new book, an even more relevant book than it was when, I guess, when you delivered the manuscript, Gia Lin. One Mighty and Irresistible Tide, The Epic Struggle Over American Immigration, 1924 to 1965. Thanks for talking with me for an addendum to the original interview we did. It was my pleasure. Thanks, Nick. <laughs>